Hello and welcome to episode 20 of When Life Gives You Lemons Go Vegan. I am your host, Corinne Nidja. This episode brought tears to my eyes because I totally am a super fan of Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. I found him initially in the documentary Forks Over Knives, which really helped to solidify my own health changes and diet changes with multiple sclerosis many years ago. He is such a pioneer for this movement, which really, I don't, I can't describe it, but for me, meeting someone and speaking to someone who's had such a, whose work has had such an immense impact on my own health and the health of so many people that I value in this community. I was really, really touched that he agreed to come on the show and very overwhelmed. I felt like a Beatles fan, I kept saying. I was, I think I I did actually cry. At one point, I was just so overwhelmed that I was speaking to this man that I've admired for so many years. So if you don't know who Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn is, you should. And you should read his book, which I hadn't when I did the interview. And so I've bought the book. It's on its way. I won't let Anne and Colbull down. I will. I will read it and I will send them some notes about how amazing it is. He is an American physician and he's worked most of his life out of the Cleveland Clinic, but he was also a surgeon in the Vietnam War. And he is the author of the best-selling book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, which promotes a low-fat, whole food, plant-based diet to help prevent and reverse heart disease. And it has been advocated by none other than President Bill Clinton, which is pretty awesome. He was also featured in the documentary Forks Over Knives, which is where I first found him and I bought the cookbook and I bought his son's cookbook, the Engine 2 cookbook, just recently. Rip Esselstyn's cookbook and with his daughter Jane Esselstyn as well. They have lots of other cookbooks as well. So check them out online. And he also, which I did not know, he's just a multi-talented man. He also won gold in the men's eight rowing event at the 1956 Melbourne Olympics, which I only found out when I was researching him for this interview, uh, which is pretty awesome. So he's an incredible man, incredible pioneer for the low-fat, whole-food, vegan movement, plant-based movement, and just a rich, a wealth, a wealth of information around disease prevention. So without further ado, please enjoy this interview. If you have no anyone with heart disease, this is the interview for you. I couldn't remember your story and I couldn't find your original email. My story is I have multiple sclerosis. I've had it since 2004. And last, so through the journey, I've met lots of people who've adopted a low fat plant based diet to improve their health. And last year, I thought people always find my story really hopeful because I was very overweight. I was really sick. I went numb from the waist down. I was sleeping and depressed and my 20s were just a nightmare of illness and fibromyalgia and chronic pain and regular relapses. And once I adopted this way of eating in two, around 2008 and then very seriously after I had my son, you know, I started running and exercising and I lost weight and I haven't had a relapse since 2008. And I met lots and lots of people with similar stories about different health conditions who also ate this way and improved their health dramatically. And I obviously I read lots of, uh, watched Forks Over Knives and I read lots of your work and your YouTube, lots of things about you. And I, that was was so inspiring to me to hear more and more doctors. There's not very many in Australia. So to hear all of your work and your incredible pioneering efforts to bring this way of eating to more people. And I thought, well, what can a little person from Melbourne do? So I thought, well, in 2004, there wasn't very many stories like mine available. Like there wasn't really Facebook or anything like that. And it was very lonely trying to go against mainstream medicine saying there's no science to diet, you know, you you may as well just eat whatever you want. And I spent a lot of time eating whatever I want and getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Um, And so I thought, well, if I, people just think that maybe I'm just a one-off little outlier who happened to was going to be okay with MS anyway. But so I thought, you know what, I'm going to collect interviews um, with other people like me so that there's a big body of people like me and their recovery stories to say, it's not just one person 
getting better. It's so many people getting better. And so I started a podcast called When Life Gives You Lemons, Go Vegan. <laughs> and and I've got now 20 episodes. Well, you'll be there. This, 20 episodes this Sunday um, of people with rheumatoid arthritis, with heart disease, with type 2 diabetes, with breast cancer, with Crohn's disease, with MS, with asthma, with PCOS, with just lots of different conditions and lots of doctors. And I just want to do my little tiny piece by saying like there's there's not just one person getting better. There's so many. And so, yeah, I reached out to you guys and I'm so happy that you said yes. And I just hope that having you on the show as well will be another way to spread the message by having someone so credible and so well known on the show. Does that help? I have a couple of questions. Yes, please. Um, can you share with uh, how they made the diagnosis, in other words, when they did the MRIs, could they see? Yeah, there was le- lots and lots and lots of, there was lots of lesions on my brain. So the diagnosis was MRI based only, and there was lots of lesions on my brain. And then since that time, do they, there's, well, I believe there's more than one type of uh, MS. Yeah. So mine was relapsing remitting. Yeah, relax, relaxing remitting, got it. Okay, and the other one is what? Progressive? Progress, primary progressive and secondary progressive. Wait a minute, I want to be sure I write these yeah, down. Sure, sure. One is relaxing remitting. The second one was... Primary progressive, which means that you don't have any remission. And obviously, sorry. <laughs> and then secondary progressive, which is what relapsing remiss- remitting most often ends up being. Secondary progressive, meaning relaxing remitting uh, after an, a certain period of time, somebody has another uh, episode. Yep. And uh, they yeah. stop recovering um, and they just have more and more and get more and more disabled. Would you ever be interested? In- would you ever be interested in speaking to a physician who uh, herself has had uh, MS? Absolutely, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. I may be able to, I'm able to be able to work on that if, and have them, uh, you have your email, I'll have them contact you because I, I think it's kind of exciting what you're doing. If you can get, if you would hear, because both of these, these are not lay people, these are physicians. Very. One is making a movie about her MS, and the other is a very uh, accomplished physician at a uh, very highly regarded medical institution in this country. So uh, I can get them to, uh, uh, with your blessing, I can get them to correspond with you from email, and then you can take it up, take it up from there. And because it just seems to me that I guess I'm a little bit uh, anxious that this this kind of experience shouldn't just be out in talk shows, although I, I don't misunderstand me. I, I think what you're doing is great and the information has to be out there. Yeah, yeah. But for the, for the, for the medical community to grasp it, the medical community will not be convinced by hype and snake oil. The medical community will be, can be convinced by scientific studies or publication. So I'm hoping that one of these physicians would take these cases and you know, write it up even as nothing more than a, a, a case report because that way it does pack a lot more uh, really a, a significant scientific uh, muscle that is required to really keep pushing this forward. Absolutely, absolutely. What have your physicians said when you go back to them and they see how well you've done? They just say, it's, oh, it's just because it's... Uh, you're in a, a relaxing remitting and uh, these things have their own uh, time course. Or, or they say, My, what you're doing is wonderful. I'm so impressed. No, unfortunately, I went, I was going, you go yearly. I was advised to go yearly. So from 2004 till 2008, I was going yearly. And in 2000 and and through that time, I kept, I'd read about diet, the Swank. I don't know if you'd read the Roy Swank research about diet NMS. Roy Swank, yeah. yeah. So I'd read that and, and, and my doc kept bringing it up and my neurologist kept saying, look, forget it, just eat whatever you want. And in 2008, when I, the MRIs, from what I could see from the scans that I did have, when I was eating this way, the lesions were reducing and he would say, oh, that's just a coincidence, just keep eating what you want. But I'm like, but surely if they're reducing when I'm eating healthy and they're increasing when I'm not eating a plant-based diet... 
I should eat a plant-based diet. And my mum kept saying, oh, you know, because my mum wanted me to be able to eat whatever I want. So she's like, oh, listen to him. He's the expert. Just eat whatever you want. And so I'd go away and I'd eat whatever I want and I'd get sicker. And in 2008, when I woke up and I couldn't feel my, well, I was numb and I, my legs were numb. I went and I had the steroid, intravenous steroid treatment. And he said, look, you know, you spent four years trying it your way. It's time for you to t- accept the medication treatment that we're telling you that you advising you to take. Otherwise, you're going to get sicker and sicker until you die. And I don't know what happened, but I'm a bit of a, I never, ever went back. So I haven't been back since 2008 because I was so upset with him for giving me this huge kind of death sentence. And so I haven't been back. Oh, how about we, we t- t- tonight, we're going to tighten up your, uh, tighten up your program if you're that committed and want to do it. We're going to have someone. At least I'll share with you what Moe seems to, seems to think is really rather powerful for this. Okay, let's go ahead. How much time you got? Okay, so how much time have you got? I've got like as much time as you will give me. I just, I'm, it's up to you, obviously. Well, I don't want people to get overdosed and be tired of my <laughs> voice. Okay, well, so normally what I do is I give an introduction pre-recorded, so I won't give a formal introduction now, and then I just ask you to fill in, like, the blanks of my introduction. Uh, So I'll just be talking about, you know, that you're an American physician and that you wrote a best-selling book, The Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, and that that was promoted also by Bill Clinton, and that, you know, you're a gold medal rower. I only just learnt myself yesterday when I was doing (laughs) doing some research on you. Yeah, you know that, you know where I got that, you know what what country I got that in? Australia, I saw! I was like, wow! Ballarat! Ballarat! Was it Ballarat? Oh, wow! And I thought, well, wait, I have you. I guess I should focus on heart disease. So would that be okay with you to focus on heart disease specifically? Yeah, I insist. You insist? Yeah. Perfect. But it affects all diseases. I'll get to that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so I will introduce you. And I thought that basically I'll I'll have introduced you and then you can just give us a bit more of a background about your work now and what you do. Um, So I'm just going to say... I'll start now and just say, hello, Dr. Esselstyn. I am so, so grateful and humbled to have you on our, on my show and this show to speak to people because I love your work and the work that you've done as a pioneer for the low-fat, whole-food, vegan, plant-based movement. Um, I loved Forks Over Knives. I, um, I haven't actually, I have to admit, I haven't read your book, but I'm going to put it on my Booktopia order list so I'm going to buy it and give it a read because my mom has a long history of heart disease and I would love to read it and give it to her. So thank you so much for being on the show and welcome. Thank you, Corinne. <clears throat> Delighted to be with you. So if you wanted to just give us a little bit a bit more fill in the blanks that I haven't shared or a bit of information that you think people need to know about you or should know about you, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn, Jr., and uh, I you gave it a little bit of background that although I grew up on an Aberdeen Angus and a dairy farm in upstate New York, I went away to uh, college at, at Yale, and after Yale, I went to medical school at the Western Reserve University School of Medicine in Cleveland, and after that, I had my uh, postgraduate of training my internship and residency in general surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. And after that, I was in the Army. First year, I was at uh, Fort Bragg in North Carolina. The second year, I was a combat surgeon in Vietnam. And then uh, I came back and was asked uh, to join the, the surgical staff at the Cleveland Clinic. And in the course of my duties, I was uh, named the chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force and head of the section on thyroid and parathyroid surgery. But it was in my uh, role as chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force in the late 1970s, early 80s, that I became increasingly disillusioned with the fact that for no matter how many women I was doing breast surgery, I was doing absolutely nothing for the next unsuspecting victim. and. This led to a global research on my part. Uh, And sure enough, it was quite striking that there were many other countries where breast cancer rates were 30 and 40 times less frequent than the United States, such as Kenya. And if you were to look at the 
breast cancer rates in rural Japan in the 1950s, breast cancer was very infrequently identified. And yet as soon as they migrated to the United States, the Japanese women, still pure Japanese American by the second and third generation had the same rate of breast cancer as their Caucasian counterpart. And perhaps even more compelling was cancer of the prostate in the entire nation of Japan in 1958. How many autopsy proven deaths were there from cancer of the prostate? 18. The most mind-boggling health figure I think I've ever encountered. And in 78, 20 years later, they were up to 137, which still pales in comparison to the 28,000 who will die this year in this country from prostate cancer. But Nevertheless, I just at that point in this uh, review, I felt there would be more bang for the buck if I could look at the leading killer of women and men in Western civilization, which was cardiovascular disease, because uh, there were so many cultures that I was encountering where cardiovascular disease was virtually non-existent. And it just seemed to me that if we somehow could persuade persons to eat to save their heart they would begin saving themselves from the common western cancers of breast, prostate, colon and perhaps pancreatic. Then I decided I'd have to do this study because it, let's really get some science into this. Is it is it true that if we take patients who are seriously ill with heart disease is it possible that we could get them to eat plant-based and either begin to prevent halt or maybe even reverse some of their heart disease. So uh, after uh, after I (laughs) first decided myself for a year and that was that was a little bit difficult because in all honesty I was a cholesterol holic and I, I really loved all these terrible foods but I just knew I was going to do this study and it is said that you go through several phases when you're going to change your lifestyle. Uh, you start over here with uh, contemplation, pre-contemplation. Next you go to contemplation. Then you go to action. And then you go to maintenance. So I was probably over here somewhere around contemplation. And uh, I can specifically recall uh, the day that I... That, that it happened. I was at a surgical meeting with my wife, Anne, in New Haven, Connecticut, and the, uh, gosh, the papers were very dull and boring, and the weather was terrible, but they always have a, a banquet after these things, and the waitress put a plate in front of me where the roast beef was so enormous it was draped over the sides. I took one look at it and said, that this, this is my moment, and, I, and my wife said, are you not going to eat that? I said, no. She said, well, then I'll have it. Well, uh, Anne, Anne's mother had actually died of breast cancer at age 52. <clears throat> and two weeks after that uh, meeting in New Haven, her sister came down with breast cancer. And then she looked at me and pointed her finger and said, I'm with you. So we then began uh, eating plant-based. And uh, I was quite happy with the, the results that I began seeing in my own cholesterol. And so I, in... Uh, August of 1985, I went to the chairman of cardiology and asked if I could have 20, 24 patients, with the, which was the moment number that I could have and still fulfill my surgical obligations. <clears throat> and these, as my late brother-in-law used to say, that these were Essie's walking dead. <laughs> they, had fa- they had failed their first or second uh, they had failed their first or second bypass. They had failed their first or second angioplasty. They were too sick for this procedure or they had refused. Five were told by their expert cardiologist they wouldn't live out the year. And those five made it all to 20 years. And we began seeing some rather striking evidence, not only of halting disease, but when we carefully studied them, there were a number who were actually reversing their disease. And so that was uh, sort of the background. Uh, which led me to be so excited about this that after I retired from surgery, uh, I uh, kept my interest in this and got rehired by the clinic at the Wellness Institute where I presently direct the cardiovascular disease uh, prevention and reversal uh, program. 
And it's very exciting to uh, see these patients come from throughout the United States and Canada who have come to recognize that this disease is not a result of your genes or your stress, that this is a result, this is a foodborne illness. For example, if you were a cardiac surgeon and you decided that you were going to hang out your shingle in uh, Okinawa, rural China, the Papua Highlands in New Guinea, Central Africa, the Tarahumara Indians in northern Mexico, forget it. You better plan on selling pencils. They don't have any cardiovascular disease there. Why? They all thrive on whole food, plant-based nutrition without oil. Now, the thing that the medical uh, profession really has to hang their head is in recognition of the fact that here in the United States, we have built a billion dollar health industry around an illness that does not even exist in half the planet. Mm, so true. So, uh, it's from that point on, <clears throat> it would probably uh, might be of interest to your listeners if I just shed a few ideas on where we think this disease has its inception, its onset, its beginning. Yes, please. And this is, interestingly enough, where all experts agree. I've always, I've always said that the truth be known, coronary artery heart disease is nothing more than a toothless paper tiger that need never, ever exist. And if it does exist, it need never, ever progress. This is a completely benign foodborne illness. And where experts agree is the following. Where this disease has its inception, its onset, its beginning, is when we progressively injure the life jacket and the guardian of our blood vessels, which happens to be that delicate innermost lining called the endothelium. And the endothelium manufactures a truly magic molecule of gas, nitric oxide. And nitric oxide has a number of absolutely wonderful functions which makes it the salvation and protector of all of our vasculature. What are these functions? One, nitric oxide keeps all those cellular elements in our bloodstream flowing smoothly like Teflon rather than Velcro. Number two, nitric oxide is the strongest blood vessel dilator in the body. You climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, the arteries to your legs, they widen, they dilate, that's nitric oxide. Number three, Nitric oxide protects the wall of the artery from becoming stiff, thick, inflamed, protects it from having hypertension, high blood pressure. Number four, here is the absolute key. A safe and adequate amount of nitric oxide will protect you from ever developing blockages or plaque. So literally everybody on the planet, whether they're from Berlin, London, New York, Chicago, or even Brisbane or Melbourne or Sydney or Ballarat, if they have cardiovascular disease, it's because by now, in the preceding decades of their life, they have so sufficiently trashed, injured, and compromised the capacity of their endothelial cells to make nitric oxide, they don't have enough protect themselves from making these blockages in plaque. But the good news is this, this is not a malignancy. And once you can get patients to grasp and understand this, that they made this disease, and you are going to empower them to halt and reverse this disease, it is very, very uh, exciting. Now, to make this there are really no exceptions. In other words, I don't have a program that is 90% or 95%. It's 100%. Now, what are the foods that every time they pass your lips, you absolutely decimate trash and injure the capacity of the endothelial cell to make nitric oxide? They are. Any drop of oil. Olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil, oil in a cracker, oil in a piece of bread, Oil in a salad dressing. Oil injures your endothelial cells, as does anything with a mother or a face. Meat, fish, chicken, fowl, turkey, eggs, and 
anything that is dairy, milk, cream, butter, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt. You should have seen how I was received when I said that in New Zealand. (laughs) Not great in sheep country. (laughs) And sugar, sugary drinks, diet colas, Pepsi, Coke, cakes, pies, cookies, stevia, agave, excesses of maple syrup, molasses, and honey. And I don't like coffee with caffeine. Now, of all those things I've listed, do you ever eat any of those foods? I do eat maple syrup sometimes. That's my one vice. <laughs> Just go, go very easy because sugar, you know, yeah, you can go maple syrup very, very lightly. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a lot. And I think that that's such a good thing for listeners to hear because I think I actually had in my questions for you about oils because people talk about Mediterranean for heart health and lavishing olive oil and coconut oil on their food. You can talk about Mediterranean all you want, but there has never, ever been a study using the Mediterranean diet with patients seriously or with heart disease where it has been able to halt or reverse the disease. Yeah, the Mediterranean diet is great if you want to slow the rate of disease progression, but you're going to have progression. Thank you for that. That's a really great answer because that was one of the things I was going to talk to you about was oils because people are always like, but what about olive oil? And I'm just like, no oil. What are they going to eat? You're going to eat all these marvelous whole grains for your cereal, bread, pasta, and rolls, 101 different types of legumes, beans, and lentils, all these marvelous red, yellow, and green leafy vegetables, and some white potatoes, especially sweet potatoes, and some uh, and some fruit. Now, this is a very powerful diet, and somebody's going to say, well, where do you get your protein? There is protein in grain, there is protein in beans, there is protein in vegetables. As a matter of fact, the strongest human being on the planet is a German Babudian who has lifted over 1,200 pounds, and uh, he's plant-based. We have found increasingly that professional athletes in this country are switching to plant-based because, one, greater stamina, two, shorter recovery time. That's kind of the uh, the story. Now, there's one other thing that we've added in the last in the last six or seven years that uh, is a little bit of a burden for uh, patients, but it really is uh, pays tremendous dividends. Now, as you know, when somebody has heart disease, they've got these blockages in the arteries going to their heart. And I asked the patients to imagine that you could somehow shrink your head and get it inside that artery and look at the plaque. What you would see would be an absolute cauldron of oxidative inflammation. So we need antioxidants. No, don't go down to the health food store and buy a jug of pills that says antioxidant because it doesn't work and it's going to be harmful. You're going to get your antioxidants from food, okay? What food? Food that is high in what we call ORAC value, O-R-A-C, oxygen radical absorptive capacity. So this means that if you're having raspberries, blueberries, strawberries, and blackberries on your oat cereal in the morning, terrific, but nothing can trump the antioxidant value of green leafy vegetables. So I need these patients with heart disease six times a day to chew to chew a green leafy vegetable that is roughly the size of their fist after it has first been boiled in water, five and a half to six minutes, so it's now nice and tender. And then they must, must anoint it with several drops of a delightful balsamic vinegar. Why? Because the balsamic vinegar has acetic acid, which helps to restore the nitric oxide synthase enzyme contained within the endothelial cell that is responsible for making nitric oxide. So they're gonna chew this alongside their breakfast cereal, again as a mid-morning snack, again at lunch with your lunch sandwich. That's three, mid-afternoon four, dinner time five, and of course I adore it when you have that evening snack of kale. What are you doing? All day long, You are bathing and you are basking that horrible oxidative cauldron of inflammation with nature's most powerful antioxidants. Now, what are the green leafy vegetables I'm talking about? They are bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard green, beet greens, mustard green, turnip greens, napa cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and arugula, and asparagus. And the top six are kale, Swiss chard, spinach, arugula, beet greens, and beets. 
Can you write that fast? I can't. I'm writing them now. I don't even, just for myself. And I'm like, no, I can't. <laughs> but I got enough and I'll. So, wow. So, four, t- five, five, no, six times a day, you're saying, to eat these? Yeah. So, if you cooked it, because people. Cause, well, these, these are for the patients. Yeah. These are for the patients. With heart disease. Who have heart disease. Yeah. So, for them, if they were like, whoa, six times a day, I'm, I'm working a job, you know, how am I going to get this? Can they take it cold if they've cooked it and it's got balsamic and they put it in like a little container to have it? Maybe twice a day you could do the spinach raw, providing you had the uh, flask of balsamic with you to anoint it. But I think that the uh, uh, heating of it, heating of it tends to break down the cellular walls, making the phytonutrients much more available. Okay. And what does the balsamic vinegar do? It's also much more tasty. I'm not, I'm not going to eat turnip grains raw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, gross. What does the balsamic vinegar do to the, does it help break down those walls more? Is that what the purpose of the balsamic vinegar is? No, no, no. The purpose of the balsamic is the acetic acid. The acetic acid, from a research standpoint, has been shown to restore the nitric oxide synthase enzyme, the enzyme in the endothelial cell that is responsible for making nitric oxide. That's enhanced by the acetic acid, yeah. You're trying, we're, we're not doing this by hype and snake oil. We're trying to, I'm trying to give you the science for your life. Thank you. This is important. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Can I ask you, with pe- when people come to you with heart disease and they want to make the change and you tell them, like, you know, like yourself, they're in that pre-contemplation stage and they want to, but they love burgers and fries and cakes and junk food and all those things. We're running right now close to a 90% adherence. And this is a very significant change. If you were to take, somebody will say that our program maybe is strict or extreme or draconian. Nonsense. The most strict, extreme program on the planet today is the one that 97% of Americans, New Zealanders, Australians are eating, which guarantees that before they die, they'll have some hideous chronic illness that doesn't have to exist. And I don't care if somebody loves burgers, but you explain to them, look, the reason you got this disease is because of the burgers you ate, you absolutely so decimated your population of endothelial cells that they are right now they are an absolute train wreck. And what you're asking me is if you can eat more burgers, you're going to take that train wreck and make it worse so you can hasten your second heart attack or forget that in your heart, the vascular disease spreads, Lord forbid, and it starts to go to your head and your brain and now you've got vascular dementia. That's crazy. For anybody with a brain in their head, once you have them understand the science, no matter how much they love their hamburger, they can begin to suddenly love these other foods just as well, then it's exciting. But there's absolutely no reason for them to feel that I'm entitled to go ahead and destroy myself. No, and who wants that? If they've got a pain in their head, they will downregulate their fat receptor, they'll downregulate their sugar receptor, they'll begin to be able to give up a food that is delicious and is destroying them for another food that is delicious and enhancing it. Because you see the insidious thing right now, about the uh, uh, this uh, Western diet, it looks delicious, it tastes delicious, it smells delicious, and while it is at, while it is absolutely destroying you, you feel no pain until the advanced. Because we know from autopsy studies, this disease starts when you're tw- when you're twelve when you're twelve years old or earlier, and if you autopsy. Young women and men between the ages of 17 and 34 who have died of accidents, homicides, and suicides. Now the disease is ubiquitous. Not enough at that age to have your cardiac event, but you keep building on that. And now in your 40s, 50s, and 60s, they start having the strokes and heart attacks. Just going on from what I was going to say, was what you're saying is that once they have the science that... Was there any other things that you help that you use to help people to commit? Do you know what I mean to get, to get past that contemplation? Like you had your beef, your beef moment. What are some things that you can? Oh, you'll get all kinds of excuses, and I'll say, "How often do you eat out?" Oh, not very often. I said, "Well, let's try that again." How often do you eat out? Well, maybe three, three, three times a week. Okay, and one of those famous restaurants 
in Dallas, Texas, that you are eating out that are known for the arrest and reversal of heart disease? Oh, well, I didn't think of it that way. Because you can't go to a restaurant practically without getting anything that's covered with oil. So you have to, therefore, the first thing you do, if you sit down in a restaurant, when the waiter or the waitress comes, you look them in the eye, one eye, you can't look at both, one eye, and you say, understand this, that I am absolutely deathly allergic to a single drop of any oil. Oh, well, and then you start searching the menu, and well, we could do this, we could do that. If it doesn't work out, just ask them quietly and, and, and gracefully with manners. Could I please speak to the chef? Chefs are absolutely so flattered. When they hear that, they say, fine. Here we go. We'll get your baked potato. We'll get you some rice and beans. We'll get you some. I mean, it's, it's very, uh, uh, very exciting when they feel challenged and they'd like to do it. Now, the other thing is, if you're eating out three or four times a week, so let's say three times a week, that's 156 days out of the year, out of 365. That's a lot. That's three times a week. That means those are the days that you are still aggressively destroying your endothelial cells. Look, there are four reasons to eat out. One, you don't have to do the... The dishes. Cooking. You don't have to do the dishes. Three, the ambiance. Four, the companionship. You never ever go out to eat to further destroy more endothelial cells. Now, what are you going to do if you get asked to somebody's house and you don't want to insult them? Now, if it's a larger meeting and it's a buffet, you put on your plate all this horrible food you know you're not going to eat. You play with it, turn it around. You eat before you go and you eat when you come back. But you never eat that food. If it's a small party, four to six people, you've known them a long time. You talk to the hostess when you first come in the door and you say, uh, Look, uh, owner, we've known you and Bill for many years, and I, I know I'm not going to embarrass you, but I just, I'm not going to be able to eat this because right now I am being cared for by this physician in Cleveland, Ohio, who is an absolute monster. <laughs> I'm going to remember that for my mom. <laughs> but there's no, there's no excuse to say that, you know, this little monster, because once you start breaking the rules, it's an absolute slippery slope, and then you lose they go off the wagon. It's so true. I think that's, yeah, it's great. It's great to give them some tips because people do think when you go out, like when you go to a friend's place for dinner, what do you say? And I pack like a whole esky of food to take to my friend's house. Don't worry about me. I've packed a whole thing. <laughs> oh, I wanted to talk to you about your work now. Yeah, I'm, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm presently chairman of the Cardiovascular Disease Prevention and Reversal Program at the Cleveland Clinic <clears throat> Wellness Institute. And what... Uh, is exciting is that we get patients since they come from outside of the state of Ohio they and let's if they're coming from California Texas and Florida they can't stay for days at a time in, in Cleveland where I work so we really a couple of decades ago we decided that I was obligated to synthesize to try to put together a single day intensive seminar so these patients are going to learn all about how they created their illness in the first place and precisely how are them as the locus of control to halt and reverse their disease. And in addition, everybody's going to get a very hefty notebook. And that notebook is, contains every single PowerPoint slide that I use during the day, several of our scientific articles, a 44-page uh, handout with many additional recipes that add to the 240 in the two books that we provide. And in addition, there is a marvelous woman with 30 years experience uh, uh, acquiring and preparing plant-based foods, dealing with reading ingredients, travel and restaurants. And then everybody receives a DVD of the entire seminar that I filmed earlier one. Uh, so that if they go home and get forgetful or rusty, they can flip this on and get themselves back up to speed. Uh, then we always... Uh, have three wonderful local and regional patients who have had uh, a very successful uh, experience share their story with those in attendance who can then say to themselves, listen, if he or she can do this, I can do this. And then we have a delightful plant-based lunch, uh, answer all questions, and then stay in touch as necessary through email or phone call. And it's uh, been very gratifying, very exciting. Uh, to see how these people have blossomed and, they've, and I've written them up in the 
couple of scientific publications. All this is on my website. Okay, I'll be putting your website in the outro. Well, but if you, if you want to top it, is your website your name or is it the Cleveland Clinic or what is your website? DrEsselston.com. Is there any chance that you're going to, like the DVD could be released to audiences in Australia and New Zealand to access the information if they can't get all the way over to work with you? Because I'm sure people listening will be like, oh my gosh, I'd love to, but a trip to the States is... I think they can find it on my website. Oh, perfect. Perfect. If you're listening, go along to the website, DrEsselston.com. Yeah, my talks and presentations are on YouTube and on Facebook on... And you have to read his book. I know, I know. I have to, I have to. They were talking about it at a doctor. Kim Williams was here and he talked about it, your book at his event as well. Kim's a good guy. He seems like a really nice guy. He came for the tennis tournament and to do a symposium here, which was great. You'll have to come along and do a symposium here too. Any chance you're going to be in Australia? (laughs) Oh, you never know. You never know. That would be... Is this this Melbourne? Melbourne. Melbourne, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's- yeah. Our daughter Jane has uh, is doing some YouTube little quick cooking things that you might. I just bought your cookbook, your your daughter Jane's cookbook, the other week. It's the cookbook. Yeah, it's called the Engine Two Cookbook. Yeah, that's what I I bought it. I'm very excited. It's called yeah. the Prevent and Reverse Heart. Well, Jane and I wrote the Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease Cookbook, but. The, anyway, that one, but you might have fun looking at the engine, t- um, the, um, I don't know, look under Jane Esselstyn on YouTube. Okay, everyone, you're listening, Jane Esselstyn's cooking videos on YouTube, and they have the amazing Engine 2 cookbook, which is Rip, Rip Esselstyn and Jane together, is that right? Jane, yes. And I bought it, and I have to say, I already made a few things delicious, very excited Good. to promote that cookbook because I love it and um, in my fact my kids it's approved by six-year-olds and two-year-olds which is always the test of any recipe <laughs> if toddlers will eat it you know it's good that's great that's great because you're in charge of them so that you can change their taste I you know yeah so they've been whole food plant-based well mostly whole food plant-based except for when they visit their uncle and they get donut parties and sometimes I let them slip through a few. Endo- now I know that their endothelial cells are unable to produce. Oh, f- my brain slipped the, what is it? Nitrous. Nitric oxide. Nitric oxide. I'm feeling super guilty for being fun mum and letting them have sugar and fairy floss at the movies every now and again. But our household's low-fat whole food plant-based. It's just the occasional nightmare slip up. But now listening to this interview, I'm thinking I'm going to have to be cracking down <laughs> even more well you know what we've done is we've been talking mostly about heart disease but along the way the last 30 years running into other kindred spirits and, and sort of watching and paying attention to this the reason that uh, that what we're looking at right now is we we're at the cusp of what could be a truly seismic revolution in health and this seismic revolution is never going to come about with another pick drug or pill it's not going to come about with another procedure another stent or another operation such as bypass the seismic revolution will come about when we have the will and the grit and the determination to share with the public what is the lifestyle that will protect them from ever developing heart disease strokes vascular dementia hypertension diabetes Crohn's disease ulcerative colitis uh, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, multiple sclerosis, allergies, asthma, kidney disease. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And it's incredible to think that you can do this without any expense. You're just going to eat the safest food on the planet. It doesn't have any horrible side effects. Uh, it's not It's not Farmageddon. <laughs> I've never heard that term very good. So it really, uh, uh, it, it will come about when we in the profession have the will and the grit and the determination to share with the public the lifestyle and most specifically the nutritional literacy that em- will empower them to be the locus of control to absolutely annihilate chronic illness. I can't wait. I can't I actually feel very excited because it does feel like more and more and more people are talking about promoting pushing this way of eating into the mainstream and for me and from my kids you know I've had 
when I first started on this journey myself, the doctor said, you know, like your kids, MS isn't necessarily genetic, but it um, happens in the same families because they eat the same way, they live in the same climates, they live the same way. And so I was always thought, well, you know, from my sons, MS is often worse for boys than it is for women. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to start them on a ho- most like a whole food plant based diet, the occasional vegan but not low fat treat. And yeah, I think it's so important for me because when you go to schools and they have sausage sizzles, you know, you go to hospitals and they have bacon and they have ham and they have schools having fun runs and then celebrating the fun run with a sausage sizzle, which is like a class one carcinogen. And you're just like, oh my gosh, you know, I can't wait for my kids to be in a world where they're not constantly bombarded with meat, eggs, sugar, dairy, everywhere they turn in their school ground, in their playground, in their lunch in their lunch orders, in everywhere. So, yeah, I really can't wait for this movement to continue to the momentum that it's on and for the, yeah, for the children of the world to not be faced with a bombardment of advertising for foods that we, you and I both know are detrimental to our health in a way that's just really sad. What's, what are small things we could do to start to try and make changes in hospital food? And I know that like obviously the governments and lobby, there's all different reasons why those foods are in schools, but I just would like to pick your brain on what you think that someone like myself or someone who's listening, who's a parent, who's concerned about sc- school foods could do as a small step to, um, or if hospital foods could do as a small step to try and progress this movement in schools or hospitals. Well, in this country, a group of physicians got together to the, uh, American Medical Association, which obviously has a fair amount of clout, and I was really pretty well convinced the uh, the House of Delegates that they had to include healthier hospitals, that hospitals had to have at least plant-based options, okay? You're not, you're not fighting the dairy, you're not fighting the meat industry, but you're just saying, why is it appropriate? Because of all the, the data that are available that show how healthy plant-based nutrition is, allow your patients to have this as an option. That's that's one way to to, uh, to start. Okay. Yeah. okay, that's a great idea. So I'll talk to my doctor friends and I'll say, hop to it. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, uh, yes, thank you so much um, for being on the show. I really, really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you. I, th- I think I burst into tears like several times. <laughs> Yep, my pleasure. Thank you, thank you. Now, I owe a debt of gratitude to Anne and Essie for coming along on the show. I so, 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 so much enjoyed this interview. And I just wanted to do a little bit of a reminder, in case you missed it in the episode, his book is called Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. You can find it on Amazon Booktopia on his website, which is www dresselston.com, D-R-E-S-S-E-L-S-T-Y-N.com. He's also, like, on, there's millions of, not millions, I'm exaggerating, YouTube um, videos where you can watch him speak. And obviously, there's Fox of Anard's documentary, the cookbook, the, the cookbooks, I think, the app. There's also his son's cookbooks, the Engine 2 cookbooks, which are amazing, and his, and his daughter, Jane Esselstyn. And social media, you can find him at Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. Yes, so follow him, find him, read his books, follow his work, look at his website, social media, all those things. It's incredible. It can totally help transform your life. And it's not, as he said, which I might have missed, but if you missed it, as he says, like the recommendations in this interview aren't just for heart disease. They're for MS. They're for Crohn's disease. They're for ulcerative colitis. They're for PCOS. They're for strokes. They're for rheumatoid arthritis. They're for so many different things. So even though he's talking about heart disease specifically in this, their recommendations across the board go for most chronic illnesses that are out there today. So please enjoy and share. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe to this podcast because I put out episodes every Sunday or Monday um, with new people, new stories, recovery stories, hope stories of different chronic diseases. And 
if you haven't and you have time, if you could leave me a review or a five star rating, that would be amazing because it obviously helps to increase people's chances of finding the podcast online. And it's just really helpful to me. So thank you so much if you can do that. Also, if you are listening to this on my website, you can also find this app. If you haven't got an iPhone, you can find it on the Stitcher app for Android. Thanks again. I'll see you next week. Bye.